things I really love and some people I have tremendous respect and admiration for, um, I wanted to tell you that one of us is still working in Centennial College. And that would be Jerry Petter, who is a large force in the program here at the University called the Holly Program, and they generate a huge number of fascinating courses that are available to people all across Lincoln or all across the area. And it's a, if you haven't heard of it before, you might check it out. It's really a sensational program. And it's about as close as I think we could come to the Centennial College for adults, and particularly uh, older adults. Jerry said it's been a very effective way to get some of these older citizens off the streets. <laughs>
teachers and advisors. Um, but one thing that happened at Centennial is students learned from each other. Not long after that first semester began, uh, an anonymous person posted a message on the communal message board and said, I've been here two weeks and no one has talked about the weather. <laughs> so Centennial had a good run. It lasted 12 years. It educated 2,290 students. And I think it left quite a legacy. Uh, at last check, the University of Nebraska provides 15 different kinds of freshman learning communities. And the very best place to live on campus right now is the Robert E. Noel Residential Center. I should tell you, Robert was my almost next door neighbor for many years, and he worried about us. He worried about us quite a lot, actually. Uh, he said, I had to worry about turning you free. At what point did freedom become license, and would your experimentation injure you? Um, would you be worse off after centennial or better? Um, and I think by the end of his life, Robert, Robert was quite confident that the answer was positive, and I think he would be very pleased if he could be here today to see all of you. Um, now it's time for our speaker, who's been patiently waiting. Um, but, Ted, I'm going to give everyone else in the room a chance. I'm going to give, provide a description, and if you can fit this description, I think you should be our speaker today. <laughs> so here's the way it works. We need a person who leaves the house every morning at 6.45 a.m. Okay, that's probably quite a few of us. Um, next, you get in your car. Probably not too many of this bike to work. I wish I could say I did. Uh, now it's going to get a little harder. You're going to drive 10 miles might still be a few of us. Uh, by the way, you have to climb over the mountain or cross the river. All right, now you're in town. Uh, why was it you went there anyway? Well, you're going to pick up the papers. That would be the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. Um, anybody still in the money? Um, have I mentioned the part about you have to be a parish priest graduate degree in literature from Columbia University. And here's the hardest one. You have to have been married for 62 years. <laughs> and I suspect Ted Beck is the only person who <laughs> wonderful present. These things. That's paper. I have a list of, um, this is too bright, advisee lists from each year of the Centennial Program that I was involved in. Uh, so many of us. Um, we're ostensibly looking after all of these students. I know this, for example. John Janovey looked after Ann Bill Spock. Karen Brum, Carol Conway, Ann Feely, Roger Obel Heinrich, Peter Kerncamp, Jackie Kuhn, Lucy Lean, Kathy Liu, Colleen Lyon, Mike McCarty, Lee Neely, Nancy Newhouse, Jane Owens, and wow. <laughs> Gabriel Scott and Judy Spencer. That's a lot. Pat Knaub, Liz Lewis, Scott Morgan, Susan Welch, Wallace Rudolph, Wallace Left, and another lawyer, a younger lawyer, came in the next year. But he had already been there to help. 
He's now president of this university. <coughs> a young man who was in the Centennial program graduated and went to law school at Virginia. And who was his teacher in my major course his first year? Why the man he had in the Centennial program? Army Perlman. The students here were a remarkable bunch. One thing that should be known is so were some of the faculty. You get very biased, one. You want to see people who really put out, whom you can trust. Robert Knoll was superb. Jerry Petter was somebody whom I always trusted. And he was, without any pretense, very smart very steady. Our first year, an old professor of his at Cornell came to town. Having quit Cornell or fired by them because of uprisings, and he came to speak. And he came because of Jerry Petter. And he was really very, very good to listen to. Where he might have won, I forget, but he wrote a, a notable book later on. Robin West was a principal, though, here for every year I was involved. And that was quite lovely. One of the peculiar things, though, is how well we know the students in the program, much more widely than we normally would students who are undergraduates. Uh, I still have stacks of letters of recommendation, which, because We'd, the fellows would all know each other and converse. We had sort of broad scope pictures of every one of the students, and we could speak more widely of them. I won't go over them, but for example, because they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Patty Heiser, who spent last year on a fellowship at the University of Madrid, is a small fire engine of intelligence with few equals hereabouts, I suspect as a driving student and a fine, strong woman. I think her a possible candidate for Marshall and perhaps Danforth candidacies, the first needing some directing of her Spain and Latin America past. Landa Schiebinger, who you knew mainly as somebody who was present rather than was actively in the program, though she claims to have been, is a fine, fine woman, a more exceptional student, despite a high privacy of mind, an English major with work in Latin as well. She was in England studying this summer, and she intends to go on to graduate school in English. She didn't. She went into the history of science. Um, Other people are here already, so I can't read any more. Uh, <laughs> but that was neat. And part of this was preaching, preaching the Centennial Program, um, which was not without disagreements among the fellows, and certainly not without disagreements uh, between the fellows and the students, and often between students and students. We had a new chancellor come in, Mr. Zumberg. Uh, and I was called to the uh, chancellor's office to meet him and explain the, the, uh, the centennial program to him. And then, after I did so, I came back. I wrote again, wrote him or something. I mentioned, I say, the study being done under Professor Larry Brasscamp in which the 1969 Centennial Program freshmen and three comparable test groups used in 69-70 so are, are analyzed and polled once again. I hate polling. Uh, certain dates have been collected, for example, that on retention rate, and the first polls are now in and being coded. Some judgments may well be forthcoming in a couple of weeks, 
but the full reports that take rather longer. Over 500 undergraduates have been in the Centennial Program since September 69. Of these, 210 are currently current participants. The number is governed by residential space and by what we consider to be the most functional number of non-residential students. Last year, for half of this, we had a Centennial Program half floor in Raymond Hall to permit a larger number of residents. The outpost was too isolated to be a useful part of the residential community, and we're reducing Centennial Program size slightly as a consequence. We control the volume of computers, commuters, 40 to 45, because we need to fill the available beds in Love and Hepner, and because we do not want to overextend the capabilities of our six plus and minus one third FTE faculty members. This is the sort of thing you had to do. <laughs> In the spring of 1970, we found that 90% of the students wished to continue in the Centennial Program, yielding a number that would effectively have precluded a new freshman class. We set then a strict limit of 11 hours beyond the Centennial Program, which limit has forced 40 to 45 percent uh, to leave each spring, many permanently, many to return in a semester or two. All six students, and they are excellent students currently, at universities in Germany and France will be in the Centennial Program for their senior years this fall. We intentionally admit present university students to the program in January and September to keep a healthy balance between freshmen and upperclassmen and to keep an open relationship with the university student body. These students, new students, tend to be more highly motivated than average. Jim Schaefer was one who came in the first year, having already begun at the university, more highly motivated. He was. He still is. The freshmen who are selected from among the, the applicants by a chance system represent now a group biased only by the self-selection bias in their choice of study. There's that. The question, though, is what, how do we present the Centennial Program to the university in ways that we don't to the student body? When we had to make the faculty in general, and certainly the deans, believe in us. And the student body very often tested the very dickens out of that. <laughs> I remember a drug bust at which there were a number of students involved. And happily, the fellow who came over from the campus police, I knew, because he and I got to know it when my son threw an egg in a swimming pool. So we got along very well. <laughs> it's, it's possible at the University of Nebraska for an undergraduate to become, I was telling this to the new chancellor, the intellectual peer of the best graduates of the best American universities. This is not identical with can get an education equal to that obtainable at. The raw material is different here in Lincoln. Regular occasion for close attention, for personal challenge, and support even in matters beyond the classroom for participation in a comprehensible community where intellect and culture have some standing. These, as well as a diet of the best university courses and professors, make the equivalency. And there are, these are hard to come by in the usual state university. Similarly, they're met very differently, very deficiently in variously experimental programs and colleges that are mainly countercultural in existence. They occur in part for an outstanding student whom one or two professors latch on to. They occur in theater departments where an esprit de corps, your phrase, Sunberg had given it to me, 
derives from common activity. But they should more regularly be a part of undergraduate education, even, even at a large university. The several fellows in the Centennial Program are responsible for creating the occasions for individual challenge and support, for giving the attention called for, and for participating in the making of a community that works intellectually as well as socially. The fellows meet, we did, several times a semester with their advisees individually to check on engagement in the centennial course. The student normally be working under a, another fellow to talk over course plans, possible majors, and for upperclassmen, graduate school and fellowship applications. They will meet individually with students doing independent projects under them. They will meet at length each week, sometimes five or six hours, with the small groups with which they are engaged in projects. This is their primary responsibility. And in saying that these contacts are points of departure for many fellows, I will add that all fellows do not accept these responsibilities fully. But the greater number of them try. And the result, I think, is creative in ways and to a degree not exactly measured by comparative grade point averages. Now, this cannot be done for 16,000 undergraduates. 16,000 undergraduates do not want it, nor would 1,000 faculty members care to give themselves to it. Moreover, it's elitist in its hopes if not in its clientele. It asks of students that they at least imagine themselves to be serious about their education. Instantly conceded, the seriousness is no more than imaginary for a good many centennial students. But the coherent communities of students based on more than only social affiliations can be accomplished linking into common resonance in small numbers of students who take the same classes or who share common majors could be downright catalytic. We talked together briefly, the chancellor and I, about an abortive attempt to accomplish this without a computer. Robert Knoll and I will send you a note on an alternate proposal involving no shifting of staff or classrooms only the active cooperation of the computer, the housing office, and registration advising. God only knows what we asked for. I don't remember it at all. <laughs> <laughs> but they came with a computer, uh, a great big block of things like that, and which we could have used. And how much was it? $8,000. I don't think we can. However, I was told by the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, don't worry about it, we can get you tied into the big one. <laughs> so that's the way we handled that. The faculty has been a highly selective group, by and large. At our request, potential fellows are recommended by deans, department chairmen, by members of the advisory committee, by our colleagues and always by students. The quality of the appointments won credibility for the program in its first years. And we intend to keep the quality high. The Centennial Program sets the most demanding kinds of challenges for a teacher. The fellow then must have the, the intellectual and emotional capacity for such challenges. We have tried to run the program this year with two full-time and 10 part-time fellows. It does not work. The Centennial Program is a mini college, not a mini department, and various major administrative duties need to be sp spread around if the senior fellow is to be an effective teacher leader. Your full-time fellows also give a more intensive faculty presence in any daytime hour. It facilitates communication among the fellows and with the students, and the whole machine works better. The efficiency this year has been moderated by individual energies. Next fall, we will have four full-time fellows. We are happy with this fact. 
As I noted, I do not wish to remain a senior fellow, etc. The realization of the wish will be helped by my being away for the spring semester, etc., etc. This is a long thing. This ranges in this report sort of on all sorts of parts of the Centennial Program. Um, of what Jerry and I, and Robin too, had to be aware of. We could not fail. We could not let the place fail. How do you, you can't coerce a student body but somehow or other, you can at least cleverly manipulate them. <laughs> uh, I found it sort of fascinating. Uh, I loved teaching in the university before the, the centennial program began. I had some magnificent students, wonderful classrooms. It happened very briefly afterwards because I came east two years later. Um, but this was a wonderful, close experience of being a teacher without the, uh, the distance otherwise. I had a wonderful teacher at Columbia in graduate school, uh, Victorian studies. Uh, it was just great. And if he had stayed at Columbia, he was a Canadian, um, I would have gotten my degree under him, stayed my doctoral studies underneath him. He went to Harvard. Why, I asked him. And he stretched out on the long table like this and told me, he said, well, I just did it, read a big book, written a big book. And up there, I'll have a seminar and I'll have an occasional student, and I had plenty of time of my own. All right, I'm sorry. Because I thought he was a wonderful teacher, and this was simply the evaporation of that life. And I hated seeing it. My other teacher, who I very much enjoyed there, was a woman, Marjorie Nicholson, who was terrifying. She was head of the department. She dominated the graduate faculties at Columbia. She did not smile. Uh, she was this tall, and she looked like a toad. Uh, we got along very well. I don't know why, because I would ask her questions. I would tell her what I thought about something. And she would tell me, you have to learn. You have to go look at something else and turn to something else. But at least she recognized that I was there and she heard me. And she was very smart. Between these, you try to find your own way as a teacher. And you hope, and I had often wonderful students. I remember having a student who helped you in math his sophomore year when his legs were a mess because of a motorcycle accident that summer. Or was it his junior? He then went to medical school uh, following Dan Ballins to Washington University. Uh, he was very smart and he could not write plain, he couldn't do a plain sentence. So you have to find ways so that he can say what he can in a paper without having an intelligible sentence. <laughs> so this was a stress on the reader and not just on the writer. And it was fun to see. Uh, he wrote a very good paper where he was dealing with, among other things, with science in the Middle Ages science and literature in the Middle Ages. That's the broad way of putting it. What he had was three or four texts which he studied, and he understood them because he was good at math and all of that sort of stuff. 
And he could then talk in words, if not on paper, what was going on. Then you have others who could write at enormous length and say next to nothing. <laughs> and then you have another who in her senior year in the fall didn't pay, took a course with a assistance of one or two graduate students from Hong Kong in which she was studying haiku, the writing of haiku and the writing of haiku, and the proper Chinese inscriptions. And at the end of the thing, I was given a dozen pages. Each one has a haiku on it. I have no idea what they say. <laughs> She translated, she translated them for me, and I have to believe her. Now, Howard Rosenberg, that great scholar of the Centennial Program, <laughs> has a son who would be able to not only read them, but memorize them instantly. He is here, a dyslectic who goes to college and then goes to China to help Chinese people speak English and learn Chinese. And you've seen the picture, perhaps, already of Harold with a notable Japanese businessman and the crowd, and off on the far right is the son, the interpreter. Now, Howard has an, had a centennial experience, and perhaps his did not take as long as it did for many of the rest of you. Uh, but I was delighted to have him as a student, for goodness sake. And he actually worked decently for me. <laughs> <laughs> and auf Deutsch. <laughs> this is time enough. You've been a joy of my life. You were a joy back then, in, in its own way. Often exhausting, but then a teacher deserves to be exhausted. Uh, and it's worth it. And I had the wonderful company in all of you. Uh, I've been fortunate, too, in being able to keep part of it up through the years because I've chosen to live close to some of you, and that's been a help. Over the internet, other things happen, so I can see what's going on without admitting anything. Yeah. <laughs> Latest pictures and contacts and all. And there are people here, too, who were never in Centennial, who are very, very nice to see. And looking at one of them, her hat, whose father used to bring apples by each fall. That's one way to remember somebody. That's one way to get in touch with a teacher, but he did it after I'd passed in the grades. <laughs> You're a joy to see. You all look filled with life, having aged a bit, just as I have. <laughs> Thank you very much for all that you've said here and for being here. Um, I love Nebraska, and it's been quiet today, but I have a son, my middle son, who thinks only of Nebraska football games. <laughs> he went to Columbia, which rarely has them. <laughs> thank you, thank you all, and for this, I'll give you